Welcome to the screencast for Why Abortion is Immoral by Don Marquis, or Marquis. I'm not actually sure how he pronounces his name. Either way, this article can be found on page 418 in our textbooks. So this argument is quite a bit more straightforward, or at least simpler, than Jarvis Thompson's because it has a through line that kind of undercuts the argument in the standard form that we saw in the Jarvis Thompson lecture. And he focuses on the wrongness of killing. What, what exactly is the wrong making feature when we kill another person? Um, it just seems intuitive and obvious that it's a bad thing. It's nearly universally accepted that in most cases killing another person is a moral wrong. So we want to dive deep and figure out what is it about most killings that make killing wrong. And his answer is that the victim of the killing suffers one of the greatest losses that a human being can suffer. And that loss is that you lose all future human experiences that you would have if you kept on living. Um, it isn't the change in the biological state from living to dead because the subject goes away. The biological subject goes away in a killing and everybody dies anyway. But it's the rich human future that disappears. He argues that People's lives have intrinsic value, which means that they're valuable for their own sake. When you possess life, your experiences are valuable for their own sake. Um, and those experiences include what you enjoy, your projects, your activities, what you create and make, your uh, relationships. These highly variegated and complex networks of experience. Now this is a little bit of background. It's not quite in the in the article, but he assumes you're familiar with this fallacy, so I wanted to give you a little bit of a, a background. Uh, it's called sometimes the naturalistic fallacy or the is-ought problem. And I told you that sometimes moral theorists define morality in the most general way as how things ought to be. And I've also told you that there's a difference between facts in the world and our evaluation of those facts as good or bad. Uh, this is called the fact value distinction. And it can be a really huge difficulty when we try and figure out our moral arguments. Uh, one of the more famous instances or elucidation, elaborations, I guess is the word I was looking for, of the is-ought problem was from David Hume, who is a really well-renowned philosopher that surprisingly we haven't really read in this semester, but if you take other philosophy classes, you're very likely to read Hume. And he was writing in the 1700s. He articulated the is-ought problem with an illustration and in other ways, but the illustration is uh, especially vivid. He says, say you are a, a police detective and you encounter a very gory murder and you remark that this was a vicious murder. And he asks, well, what about the physical facts, the actual scene on the ground, the body, the viscera, the room, where is the viciousness? in the actual world. Because remember, facts are things that we are reporting about the world as we think they are. So uh, the weight of a kilogram, or the distance from the earth to the sun, or the makeup of an atom. Our evaluation of those facts, uh, it's hard to see what properties of the world contribute the viciousness, contribute the evaluative judgments. Uh, so it's very difficult to explain goodness and badness in the world using physical facts alone. 
So the question would be for uh, Don Marquis, why should taking away a future be bad? It's just the fact that the um, the experience, the future possible experiences that we value might go away. Where does the badness come in? On page 419, uh, he says he's not committing this fallacy. He's not deriving an ought from an is when he tells us killing is bad because the future is gone. He accepts that what we find morally repugnant is just another basic fact about the world. Now, this is a really big thing if you are a philosopher who's familiar with these arguments, and you might argue that he just glosses over it a little bit, because when people say that something is a basic feature of the world, you can't analyze it any further. It just is. And the ought, meaning that the killing being bad, is just a basic fact about human life. Killing is bad. It's a natural property, and we can't analyze it any further. But he does provide some argument as to why futures are intrinsically valuable. He says moral theory has to match our most basic moral intuitions. And we already regard killing as one of the worst actions possible. And any moral theory has to explain why we think that. And this future theory, so the deprivation of a human future, does provide an explanation of why we regard killing as one of the worst actions possible. Another piece of evidence as to why his argument about why killing is wrong works is because it doesn't limit, limit valuable futures to just humans. So if there's any entity with an internal experience, remember what it's like to be a bat, there are probably other animals in the world that have internal experience and value continuing having experience. Uh, so they might have a valuable future too, even though they don't count as human beings. And you might remember that that's a flaw in Kant's theory because he based all moral judgments on the idea of human reason and moral reasoning. So it could never, uh, claim that any animal or artificial intelligence or alien or sometimes even children or developmentally disabled people count in Kant's moral system. But in this moral system where futures, valuable futures are all that matter, all of those things that we think should be covered by a moral theory are covered by a moral theory. This theory also doesn't prohibit euthanasia. Because if you are diagnosed with a terminal illness and you're in chronic pain, you do not value your future. Whereas in Kantianism, you have to respect yourself as a moral entity and suicide is always prohibited. Uh, this theory also entails that killing children and infants is wrong. It might be surprising, but other theories do not entail this. Remember, I just I noted that if you base your moral theories on the fact that human beings can reason, people who can reason less well don't get covered underneath the moral theory. And Kant and utilitarians have uh, re recognized that these are problems with their theory, but they haven't found a good non-ad hoc way which just means case by case basis to solve that problem. And this valuable futures theory does solve the problem because kids and infants have valuable futures. So now he's going to apply his idea of why killing is wrong to abortion. Uh, obviously, a fetus has this potential rich human experience future. It is, if things went normally, it would be born, become a human being, and have this rich life experience that has intrinsic value. One of the problems that comes up with this theory are people say, well, what about potential futures? So 
all sex cells inside men and women. Uh, if they met, then they'd all become humans too. So is contraception wrong? Is sex for not procreation wrong? Is masturbation wrong? It might even get to the point where every single person should try to have as many children as possible because those futures would be valuable for them. And he says no. Uh, the sex cells don't count because you need two of them to meet and become a blastocyst before they have the valuable future. So sex cells on their own do not have a valuable future. Only when they unite do they have a valuable future. And that's why abortion is al almost always morally wrong. But the stuff we'd be worried about, like contraception, are not morally wrong. Here's a quote from page 422. This value of a future like ours argument, if sound, only shows that abortion is prima facie wrong, it just means on the face of it. Not that it's wrong in any and all circumstances. Since the loss of the future to the standard fetus, if killed, however, is as great of a loss as the loss of the future to a standard adult being killed is, Abortion, like ordinary killing, can only be justified for the most compelling reasons. Now, of course, he's probably alluding to uh, the health of the mother and perhaps uh, rape or incest. <clears throat> I don't think he gives any specific details. He just says it has to be a very compelling reason to overcome this idea that you shouldn't end the future like ours. So now we have two opposing views, which can be summarized like this that I have right at the bottom. Now this is very rough, of course. Jarvis Thompson's article was very detailed and uh, Marquise, even though a little bit more straightforward, is uh, justified better than this simple summary, but sometimes it's good to have sum ups in your head to compare and contrast. So. Jarvis Thompson's argument concludes that abortion is permissible in some cases because the owner of the body in question is the mother. The fetus doesn't have a right to her body or life, even to survive, because no one has a right to other people's resources, but she can choose to give her resources to the fetus. And the conclusion of Marquise is abortion is impermissible in most cases because human futures are rich and valuable. Killing is one of the worst moral wrongs because of this feature and fetuses have this kind of future. 